Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of the Andrew Eborn Show. And I'm delighted that we are delving deeper into the paranormal, the unexplained, question everything for the truth about UFOs. And I'm delighted to welcome my very special guest, Philip Mantle. How are you, Philip? Good afternoon, Andrew. I'm fine, thank you. Wonderful. If I remember rightly, you're all the way up there in Pontefract. Yes, uh, sunny Pontefract in uh, West Yorkshire. Uh, we're about, for those that don't know where that is located, it's about 12 miles from Leeds. So uh, not, not in the wilderness, but we're here. <laughs> we love it. And not only famous for its cakes, the Pontefract cake, but various other things as well. If you were to sell me Pontefract, what would you say? Well, it played a big part in the Civil War. You know, the castle is still here, or remains of it. And uh, Pontefract even has a, a very small link to Hollywood. Oh, does it? A, a, yeah, there's a famous scene of Charlie Chaplin. He's so poor and, and, and hungry, he takes off his boot and he puts it on a plate and he eats it with a knife and fork. Well, that boot was made here in Pontefract. I remember that scene. It's made from licorice. And Pontefract cakes are made from licorice. Is there a and, yeah. good heavens? I never knew. And all these years, I remember that scene, a very famous scene of yeah. Charlie Chaplin. It encapsulated a moment in time. And that was Pontefract licorice. Yeah, we have a we have a you know, apart from this year, of course, but we have a licorice festival every summer in the town center. And um, of course, Haribo sweeties, they're made here in Pontefract as well. So Please keep eating the Haribo sweeties. It'll keep Pontefract afloat, if nothing else. Oh, fantastic. Well, look at that. Well, you sell it so well. The ambassador, the ambassador for Pontefract, which has got to be good. Yeah, and, it, and it's a Ro it was a Roman town as well. Um, I mean, just literally at the bottom of the road where I live is a little train station, and that's called Tanshelf. Well, Tanshelf was the Ra Roman name for Pontefract. And every now and again, when some new buildings are going up, they'll found, find some more uh, Roman artefacts, so they'll have to cease everything and, and, and bring the archaeologists in. So it, it's, it goes back further than we imagine. Oh, fantastic. And you actually grew up uh, just up the road a bit in Wakefield, didn't you? Yeah, I, I was born in a small sort of mining community uh, called East Ardsley, uh, just outside of Wakefield in West Yorkshire. Just a small place, still is. Uh, I moved from there just a couple of miles up the road when, when our family expanded and we needed a bigger house. Uh, my dad was a coal miner all his life, worked at the coal face uh, after he was demobbed at the end of Second World War. Uh, and my mother was from a, a rural part of Northern Ireland. So she met my, my, my birth father, who I, I didn't know because he, he died when I was two. She met him in Birmingham because um, after the war there was a lot of work in Birmingham so that's where my father and my mother met uh, and they actually got married at Shakespeare, where Shakespeare's uh, place is you know and um, they moved north to be with the rest of the family then my mother remarried a few years later so my stepfather is the man I call my dad never knew any different sadly they're both no longer with us but we, we settled in I was born and bred in West Yorkshire. My, my oldest brother was born in Wales. My, my sister was born in Ireland. So I was the only, the only one born in England. <laughs> oh, but, but between you, between you, you've conquered most of the United Kingdom, which has got to be good. Well, that's is... it. You know, when it comes to watching the sports, it's pretty much England, Ireland or Wales that are playing. I can't really lose, Andrew, you know? <laughs> So there's always somebody happy, happy in the Mantle family, which is always good. And, and you mentioned your mother. It was, in fact, your mother who sparked your interest in the paranormal, because she used to tell you that she once saw a fairy. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my mum, you know, lived on a, I call it a farm, but it was probably more of a small holding in quite a rural part of Northern Ireland. And I'll give you an example of how rural, how far away they were. She had to walk five miles to school and five miles back. You try and get somebody of school age now to walk to school, let alone walk five miles. But anyway, she, that's why she probably never went that much. Um, and down by where they lived, there was a small stream and uh, quite often she'd play there on her own. And she said one day she met a little fairy, you know, it was a lady fairy complete with pretty dress and wings. She conversed with it. And um, 
you know, I, I asked her many times down the years as I grew up, you know, was this real, Mum? And she said, well, it was real to me, son. You know, she told my children, you know, her, her grandchildren. And um, my mum was an avid reader as well. So we'd always books around the house. Uh, and she, you know, she read right the way through until she passed away. She was, uh, you know, always had a book at hand. So um, it was probably from that. I mean, I'm guessing, I don't know specifically, but as a young lad growing up, wasn't much to do where I lived, Andrew, you know, and, and there wasn't much thought of you either. You, we, we were sort of in line to either go and work down the coal mine, you know, like my father had, or in the local mill, where my brother worked in the local mill, or in industry. And that's exactly what I did when I left school. Um, I didn't really know what to do. I, I ended up working in, in, in a factory. No problem with that, you know. But uh, in between time, I'd started to read about UFOs. No internet in those days, of course. So it was either books or magazines. Uh, and for a short period in, in uh, 1979, I worked in a factory in West Germany. And when I came home, my aunt lived around the corner. And at this point, we lived about five miles from the city of Leeds. And Leeds then and still does had an evening newspaper called the Yorkshire Evening Post. And she brought it round to me and there's a little advertisement for that coming Sunday for the first ever meeting of the Yorkshire UFO Society. The Why UFO? Fantastic. Uf UFOS, Yorkshire UFO Society. So I got on the bus and in those days, of course, on a Sunday, everything was shut, you know, <laughs> literally. And I found this place uh, and in it went. It was actually... Um, uh, they'd hired a room in a, an institute that was used for the deaf, but they just hired a room that day. And uh, it had been founded by two brothers, Graham and Mark Birdsell. And there was about 20 or 30 people there, Andrew. I was fascinated because I could actually buy some more books because I was, you know, I was running out. And Graham and Mark put on a presentation. They'd obviously been involved already for a number of years. And I was hooked. I, I just felt this is where I belong. And uh, I wanted to know more. And rather naively, I thought I'll, I'll read a few more books, maybe write a couple of letters to some people. And I'll get to know everything I want in no time at all, you know. And this was, you know, now coming up to 1980. So 40 plus years have gone by and I'm still reading the books, uh, still writing the letters or probably emails today rather than letters and uh, I'm still trying to find a lot of those answers. And, and it is it is that quest and that's what we're going to be doing in this series you're now a regular on the show which is what I love and we we thought we'd drill down into a number of those different UFOs oh experiences if you like because you, you you cover a number of different areas you talk about the paranormal in and of itself and one of the things i'd like to do on the show is a bit of jargon busting if you like so maybe we start with the sort of definitions you say that it sparked your interest was sparked with your mother and the fairies did she give you more details about what she actually saw you, you said it was a female fairy yeah, i mean she went into detail she she described this little female fairy she had she said it had the most beautiful dress on it was the archetypical things you might see in Walt Disney. Right. But of course, this was, you know, my mother had no idea about Walt Disney. I had Olivia in the sticks where she did. Beautiful wings. And not only that, when she conversed with it, um, this fairy had a little bottle and said to my mom, if you drink out of this bottle, you'll never have an accident. So my mom took a drink from it. Now, whether you can call my father an accident or not, I don't know, but I don't... I, I don't recollect her ever having an accident, to my knowledge, but, you know, that, that and, you know, I mean, my mum was a, re a religious lady. She was, a, a, you know, believed in the Bible verbatim, and um, she just said it was real as far as she was con and concerned. how, how old was she at this stage then, Philip? She was, about, she was 12 years, 12, about 12 years of age. 12 years of age, and she so saw this very, was it on one occasion or on several occasions? Just the once. She only ever saw it the once. And, and, she and, where, her, and whereabouts was this? Where did this take place? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea. When uh, a few, you know, a few years later, when when the Second World War broke out, my mum could see Belfast in the distance, and of course, in those days, Belfast had the huge um, 
shipworks, yeah. the Howland and Wolf shipbuilding. Absolutely. And the Germans like had everything. I, I've seen well, the museum exactly. there. Exactly, Titanic was built there. Yeah. And the Germans had come to fly over Belfast to actually to bomb them. So my mum could see all the searchlights going up and the anti-aircraft fire in the distance. And she was terrified by it, of course, you know. So I'll give you some idea of the location of where she was. They were inland from Belfast, right. but totally cut off as far as technology is concerned. You know, they, I think they had a radio. Uh, I have two photographs of my grandfather and that is it. No photographs of my mom as a child or my grandmother or any of the others. There was five children. You know, my mom was, was three, one of three girls and two, 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 uh, two brothers. No photographs of them whatsoever, simply because they didn't have a camera. You know, they couldn't afford one. Yeah. Uh, and she talked fondly of those times. I mean, a cousin of mine has been trying to do the family tree. And when he gets to Ireland, he kind of gets stuck, you know. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, she, 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 she talks happily about those times. And of course, just a few years further on from that, she actually went to work in Belfast uh, making ammunition during the war and later she made telecommunications uh, for for aircraft, for military aircraft. But after the war, uh, the place for work was England really, so she moved to Birmingham. That's where she met my father. My father was originally from um, from Wales, from Merthyr Tydfil, and he'd done the same. He'd gone looking to that area for employment uh, and that's where my mum and dad met and you know the rest as you say is history. I have a an older brother, sadly no longer with us. I have an older sister and I, I'm the youngest. My parents, you know, my father died when I was two. My mum remarried a few years later and um, she'd moved up north because she had two sisters live here. And, um, and, and that's it. I mean, my mum and her sisters were a force of nature. Right. Andrew, you know, they might not have any, any formal education, but uh, I've often said they didn't need to send the army to, to defeat Hitler. They should have just sent my mom and her two sisters, and that would have been the end of it, you know? Uh, absolutely. So, so your, your, your mom must, at the age of 12 then, when she saw this fairy, um, she must have told her sisters about it. Did, did your aunts ever talk to you about that experience? Well, no, they, they, all they did was confirm, um, you know, that, that um, she, she talked about it. My mom was the middle of the three uh, sisters, one older, one younger. And they'd, I asked them if they ever saw anything as well, and they said, no, we never saw anything. But nonetheless, it was my aunt, uh, Emily, who was the youngest, who lived just around the corner, brought me that newspaper showing the advert for the Yorkshire UFO Society. She knew of my interest in these things and thought, oh, you know, I'll show that to, to our Philip. And had it not been for that, I would probably have never got involved, you know, I'd have been totally oblivious. Sure. So, so it sparked an interest. I mean, did, did you believe your mother? Do you, do you believe she saw a fairy? Absolutely. I, I've, I've often used this phrase that, you know, I, I believe my mother 100%, but it doesn't mean that I believe in fairies. Right. Because, and that's the interesting, and that's what we're going to look at as we drill down into the different examples, because there are some people who are very convincing and they may have convinced themselves that they've seen something which they may not really have seen. Is that fair to say? I think that is, you know, that, and that is a fair comment, yes. So, so you know, so, so what, what you're saying effectively is that your mother, you're, you're convinced that your mother believed she saw a fairy. Yes. But you're not necessarily convinced that she did. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. no, which is fine. So and I, th I think that helps the sort of belief thing. But what that did, that wonderful story, it's a lovely romantic story about drink from this bottle, but it's all got that sort of Alice in Wonderland feel about yeah. it, as you say, the Disney and the Tinkerbell and all that sort of glorious thing. Drink from this bottle and you will never, ever, ever have an accident. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the story. I mean, make of it what you will, Andrew. And like I said, she told my children the same story and they were amazed as well, you know. Uh, sadly, she died before she got to see her great-grandchildren. But And I think, you know, had she lived long enough, she would have told the story to them as well, you know. 
And are, are there other, and now that, as you say, in those days, you didn't have the internet, people couldn't share these sort of stories. So a lot was in people's imagination. So it had to be passed on from generations as, as your mother did it. Uh, now that you've heard more and you've got access to this wonderful community, have you heard similar tales of people seeing fairies? Well, I mean, there's a very famous uh, story of fairies that comes from Yorkshire, of course. That's the Cottingley fairies from the beginning of the 20th century, where Cottingley, where that is, is just, just beyond Bradford. And it's near Keithley. It's in that sort of much more rural then than it is now. You know, and the, the house is still there. And um, a young girl and her friend borrowed their father's um, old camera because uh, they used to play again down by the river and they claimed they'd seen fairies but mum and dad said oh don't be silly you know what on words to that effect so they took the camera and took some pictures and uh, you know they, they eventually leaked out and got in and uh, some very famous people you know got involved and um, but many years later of course they admitted that all but one of the pictures they claimed were a fake. And the reason they faked them was to convince the grown-ups that they had really seen fairies in the beginning. You know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the inventor of Sherlock Holmes, was convinced that these uh, events were real. But having said that, Arthur Conan Doyle had a belief system. He believed, he, got, he was very friendly with the legendary magician, Harry Houdini. Absolutely. And he saw Houdini do his tricks on stage and he was convinced that Houdini had these magical psychic powers. No matter that Houdini would tell him how he did his tricks. He said, no, that's not the truth. You are, you, this is all done by psychic means, the paranormal. And I think Houdini would have probably just got, you know. No, but there, there, there was a stage as well, as you probably remember, Philip, that uh, Harry Houdini wanted to believe. He, he basically went along when his mother passed, and he was very, very close to his mother, and he wanted to contact his mother. And he went to somebody professing to have powers to be able to speak with the dead. And he discovered that this person was, in fact, a fraud. Yes. And therefore, he spent a lot of his life, his remaining years, um, trying to debunk all the mediums. Well, that's true. Uh, the legend is that Harry Houdini and his, and, his, and his mom had some kind of statement between the two of them that nobody else knew. So if you go and meet, you know, see a medium and she gives you that statement, something quite obscure, I would imagine, yeah. and saying, I'm speaking to your, your dead mum, then it would have convinced him they were real, of course. But none of them did. He debunked many psychics, some for being frauds, some, I think, for being true believers, but not just, but, but you know, not, not the genuine article. And like, I, like I mentioned, I, I went to the spiritualist church in my early teens. My, my best mum's, uh, best friend's grandmother lived opposite, and she used to go. And I found it fascinating, Andrew, but, uh, and I didn't find any reason why they would be faking it. I think these were genuine people who genuinely believed in what, they're doing, what they were doing. But to me, it was a bit like the horoscopes you used to read in the newspaper. You print it and there's somebody that's going to convince is, is, is correct for them that day. You know, it's so general, it's got to appeal to somebody. Well, they, had I would listen. they had these Barnum statements, they called them. Yeah, they? They yeah. I would, I would, I would listen to some of these statements that the medium was giving to the to the audience, and three or four people would put their hands up. Well, I thought, well, it, it can't be for three or four people. It has to be only for one of them, you know, and, and I'd listen to what they say, and it was fairly general. But nonetheless, I don't think there were tricksters or anything like that. We know there are hoaxes in, in, in you know, in every, in every walk of life, really. But it just fascinated me. And um, the high school I went to, for example, we had one, it wasn't a religious place, but we had one lesson a week of religious instruction, not education, instruction. And we were taught what was in the Bible. And our teacher who taught that was a horrible man, as most of them were at that school. They were either horrible or hopeless in, e in equal amounts, you know. And I would slowly put my hand up at the back of the class because to me, what he was saying didn't make any sense whatsoever. And he would scream blue murder at us, you know? So I think I was about 14 and I thought, well, I'm going to read this book. It's getting me into a lot of trouble. 
So I, it took me a while. I think it took me a whole year, but I read the Bible from cover to cover, and I thought, well, I was right. It, you know, bits of it, you know, do not make sense. You know, so I was always the the, the type of lad who would want to ask that question. You know, uh, for example, I, I, you know, I went I went to work in industry, and I remember. I was being trained to work on this huge piece of machinery. I won't bore you with the details, Andrew. It's a great big plant, puffing out all kinds of toxic material. And the, the, the manager who's training me said, this goes through here, and you have to wait for 17 seconds, then you press this button. And I said, okay, but why 17 seconds? And he looked at me, and he says, you know, Philip, I've been teaching people how to work this machinery for 10 years. You're the first one that's ever asked that question. Everybody else just says, yes, boss, and pressed it after 17 seconds. So that, that, that's just the way my mind works, Andrew. And it was the same with the UFO subject or the para paranormal. I'd, I'd want to ask that question. I know, and, and I do, and, and I'm totally with you on, on that, which is why we, we call the series Question Everything. And it really is looking at that because I, and a lot of the times people try and say, and they're trying to distinguish between those who are hoaxers, who know that they're hoaxers and know it's not true, to the people who've convinced themselves that they're saying the truth. So just as, as you say, your mother in her mind was convinced she'd seen a fairy and therefore she would repeat that, that tale. She wasn't trying to deliberately lie. She didn't think in her mind it was something made up. She was convinced herself. And when we start looking at some of the individual stories and you've been a UFO investigator and we'll come on to that. When you look at those stories, there's a sort of pattern that you go through when you do a little checklist. And a good friend of mine is a chap called Nick Pope who uh, you probably know, Nick, and he worked for many years for the Minister.